Good morning, students at the Jamaica School of Preaching and Biblical Studies. And hello to all of you on YouTube watching. Welcome to Introduction to Biblical Hebrew. We are at lesson number 17, entitled Nouns and Adjectives. I started this lesson yesterday, and I'm going to be briefly reviewing what we did yesterday before moving on to the new section, still in lesson 17. Let us now go to God in prayer. Father in heaven, I give you thanks for another time that we can study the Hebrew language. Father, we know that you are the creator of all languages and that Hebrew must be a special language to you, that you used it to communicate to Moses and the prophets. And they wrote down in this language the first section of the Holy Scriptures called the Old Testament. We give you thanks that we have the privilege to be learning the, the basic rules of grammar governing this language. And may it help us that we will have a mind to study. For it is not possible only within the time that we have in the class to really learn this language. But real learning takes place when we look at the lesson for ourselves and study it and try to remember it and use it. So I pray that these students will have such a great love for this language that in spite of its difficulties, they will be able to, to master this language to such a degree that they will be able to use it to interpret the scriptures correctly, to answer skeptics' questions, and to convert people to Christ. And so, dear God, take us in charge. Help us to understand what we are about to see and to hear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. In lesson number 17, we're looking at nouns and adjectives. And you know from French and English that a noun is a word that gives a name to a person or place, thing or idea. And you know also from your own languages of French or French Creole and English or Jamaican Creole that an adjective has a relationship to noun. It's a close relationship. They go hand in hand. Adjectives add some more information about the nouns. They describe the noun. They tell you what kind of person or what kind of place or what kind of thing or what kind of idea it is. So the same thing is true for the language that the Old Testament scriptures was written in. It has nouns and adjectives. One of the students yesterday, when he heard that we were going to be studying nouns and adjectives, asked me if we were going to have another English class. Because now Nouns and adjectives are found in the English language. The fact is that nouns and adjectives are found in all languages, whatever they are. You can't have a language without having nouns and adjectives. And that is true for the Biblical Hebrew language itself. I began by looking at the fact that there is no special ending for masculine nouns. Each masculine noun has its own ending. There is not one ending for every masculine noun. 
So sus means horse. Ish means man. Navi means prophet. And Melech means king. But notice that each of these nouns have a different way to end. Sus ends in... No, my mind has gone black. Sus ends... You tell me the name of that letter at the end of Sus. What's the name of that letter? Samic. Samic. Thank you. Ish. What's the name of that last letter in Ish? Shin. Shin. Correct. Now Samic and Shin are different. Even though Samic is our S. And shin is sh. Sh is still different from s. Navi ends in aleph and it has no corresponding letter in the English language. So it is represented by an apostrophe. And that is different from the shin ending of ish and the samic ending of sus. And melek, which means king ends in kaf. That's what kaf looks like at the end of a word. And the two dots that are in kaf are the simple shiwa, but they are not pronounced. They are not to be um, called. They are silent. Each word has its own ending. There is not one special ending for every or all of these masculine nouns. So the first thing I want you to understand is that when we're looking at nouns in the Hebrew language, there is no special ending for masculine nouns. Any question before I move on to the review of um, the feminine singular endings, ending for, for nouns? Okay, now unlike the masculine nouns that have no special ending, the feminine singular noun is recognized by the accented Hamas, that which looks like our capital T, and He, ending. Notice the following words. Susa is formed simply by adding Thomas A at the end of the masculine singular now. Sus means horse, as you saw on the previous slide. But to make a female horse in Hebrew, all you do is add Thomas A at the end of Sus, and you get Susa. Words in Hebrew are usually emphasized on the last syllable. In the majority of words, the accent, even though it's not represented here by a symbol, it is understood that most of the words are accented on the last syllable. So, in pronunciation, you emphasize the last syllable. Susa. That's why I said the Thomas A is accented at the end of the word. So, sus is the masculine singular for noun, translated as horse, and to make it a mare or female horse, you add simply Thomas A at the end of sus. Now, Richard, you had a question or a comment. Go ahead. What about the last word, which one of the words? The one at the end? First, the Susa, the Thomas K, the Sire, and then the last word, the Is K. Is K. Okay. Did you think it was. Um, 
Did you think it was Tau, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet? No. All right. Because, um, Oh, okay. You have to add Kames A and He. Kames A and He. And the same with the other nouns. There's going to be a change in the vowels of some nouns when you add Kames A and He at the end. In the case of Susa, there is no change in the vowel of the original word. So you add Kamis A, which looks like our capital T in English, and you have A. So Susa is mare, M-A-R-E. I hardly hear anybody in Jamaica speaking about mare. <laughs> they just call anything a horse. Okay, so we're not used to the word mare. But in standard English, they call a male horse, horse. And the female horse, they call a mare, M-A-R-E. Yes. Yes, it looks like it's a word that is really going out of existence in English. Because... Philip. Phyllis female horse. Okay. Because while I was studying in the United States for some years, I don't remember hearing any American, whether professor or student, calling a horse a mare. They were all called horse. Okay, so, but in standard English, originally you had a distinction in name. The male is called horse and the female is called mare, M-A-R-E. Okay, now in the case of man, you saw in the preceding slide, ish is man. And to add kames A, looking like our capital T, and the he, the letter he, gives you woman. So ish is man, and all you have to do to form the word woman is to add kames a and he at the end of each. And this what this is what you get. The second word is, is e ish sha. There, there is a doubling of the shin. There is a dagish in the shin, dagish forte, that doubles the shin. So you have two shins. You only have one symbolized, but it is a double because of the dot that you have in the shin. That's why in the English letters that I use to write the word, I have put two sh, sh, sh. And then you have Thomas A, looking like our capital T, which is our R sound, and the letter A at the end of each, and that gives you Isha, Isha, which is woman. So Ish is, Ish is man, and Isha is woman. Now we come to a less easy, spelling because in the case of the third word navi which means prophet you're going to see a change in the kamis a in na in navi when you add a kamis a and a at the end of navi instead of saying navi ya because of the rush in pronouncing or stressing the last syllable, ah, the kames a under the noon in na is going to change to a half vowel, the simple shiva, the two dots, one above the other, as this. Instead of having nabiyah, you're saying nebiyah. 
because of the rush in pronouncing and stressing the last syllable, Neviah, which is prophetess. Now we have even more changes here because in the previous slide, you are familiar with Melek. The Mem has the Segol under it, which is the short E sound, E. The Lamed has the Segol under it, which is again the short vowel, E. And then of course it ends with Ka. But when you have Kames, A, and He, added to the cup, the cup will no longer be at the end of the word. When the cup is no longer at the end of a word, it can't stay like that. This is the only time when you write cup in this way. But if it, if it is not at the end of a word, it has to be like a back C. Back C. A back C. Okay, it it cannot be like this. It has to be like this. Notice the cup changes. It almost looks like a bed, but it is curved at the edge. So it's not square like the bed, but it curves around. And you have the Thomas A under the cuff, followed by the A. Now the Segol that was under the Lamed, and the Segol that was under the Mem, disappear. And instead of the Segol, you have a Pata, a short A, under the Mem, and you have a silent Shiva under the Lama, because the rule says that when the simple Shiva comes at the end of a closed syllable, it is not to be pronounced, but it is silent. And a closed syllable consists of a consonant, which is Mem, plus a vowel, which is the Patak, and another consonant, which is the Lama. So when you have the simple Shiva coming at the end of a closed syllable, then it is going, it's going to be left unpronounced. So you have mal pa, mal pa, and that is queen. Melek now becomes mal pa, and that is queen. So if any of you plan to become a king, make sure that you have a mal pa along with you. So you can have Melek and Malka, a king and a queen. Okay. So the feminine singular noun is recognized by the accented Thomas A, A ending. Any question on adding Thomas A and A to the end of masculine singular nouns to produce the feminine form of that noun. Anything that is not clear to you. So Susa is mare or female horse. Isha is woman. Nebiya is prophetess in English. The ESS -S ending, what we call suffix, is a sign of the feminine gender. Okay, so you have shepherdess, a female shepherd, poetess, a female poet, hostess, a female host. Now some of these are changing because now you have the host being referred to as a host, whether it is a man or a woman. But in original English, the ESS is an, is an ending of a word that shows that the word has been put into its feminine form. So prophetess is the female prophet. Nabi is the prophet, the third word. 
But Nevia is prophetess, the female prophet. Yes. How old? Goddess? How old? How old you read goddess? Oh, goddess. It's a good question. I'm thinking. Because the word Elohim actually has a masculine plural ending. I'm going to have to look that up in the lexicons and see how they put it. But I do not want to guess right now. I want to really make sure. So I'm going to make a note of that in my book. And when I go home, if God permit, look up in the lexicons and see what the feminine form is or whether they use a masculine form to refer to gods or goddesses. Don't remember right now. Yes. Any other question? Okay, let us move on. We also covered adjectives yesterday. An adjective is a word that describes a noun. Okay, so these are masculine singular adjectives. And just like the masculine singular noun, each adjective has its own ending. When you're dealing with the masculine singular, each of these has its own ending. Not one ending, but different endings. Tov has a different ending from the second word, ra. You don't pronounce ayin. Ayin like Aleph are not pronounced in English. So you have Ra, which is a different ending from Tov. Gathol, which is a different ending from Ra. Tov means good. Ra means evil. Gathol means great. And Ram means high. Each of them has a different ending. Any question on that? It's the same like the masculine singular noun. No special ending for masculine singular nouns and no special ending for masculine singular adjectives. However, that's not the case with the feminine singular adjective. The feminine singular adjective is just like the feminine singular noun. You can form it by adding kames a followed by the letter k at the end of the masculine singular form. So in the previous slide, you saw that the word to is a masculine singular noun that means what? Good. To means good. But if you want to bring it into the feminine singular form, what you do is add Thomas A and A at the end of To. And you get Toba. Toba is good. And To is good. So one of the students asked yesterday, in the English translation, how will you know that good is masculine and good is feminine when in the English no distinction is made in the word good itself to indicate whether it's, it is masculine or feminine? Well, the context will have to tell you whether good means masculine or feminine. For example, if I say that Tito Williamson is, is good, what do I mean when I say good? Am I referring to a masculine or to a feminine person? Masculine. Because you know who Tito is and because that is a name that male would have. As far as I know, that is a name a male would have. You know even by the name, you're dealing with a male. Tito Williamson is good. And so you wouldn't have 
pulled back because you're not dealing with a woman. No. You would have told because you're dealing with a man. So you have to use the masculine singular adjective, not the feminine singular adjective. Now, if I were talking about Mrs. Tito Williamson, or let me just say Mrs. Williamson, is good, then I would be right in using to bar because it's Tito's wife. That is the female. And so the feminine form would go with her. Mrs. Williamson is good. Toba. So for Mr. Williamson, it is Tov, but for Mrs. Williamson, it is Toba. So even though in the English translation it looks the same, because I say Tito Williamson is good, G O O D, Mrs. Williamson is good, G O O D, you know the difference because of the connection of the word good with either Tito Williamson, a man, or Mrs. Williamson, a woman, his wife. Okay, so that's how you know the difference, by the context, by how the words are connected to each other, how they're used together in a sentence or a paragraph or, or, or a page, yes. Is it, um if you want to write, she is good, it would be Isha, what is it? Okay, we haven't studied that yet, but, but it is a form of the verb to be. The verb to be is haya, to be. It's a form of it, okay, but so you would have, and you wouldn't say Isha either. We haven't learned the ending of Isha that shows the word my. You want to say my wife? It's really is she. Um, I S H I. The I ending means my. Is she? And you don't necessarily. Hold on. It's my home call. Let me see. Hello? Okay. Oh, sorry. Okay. You don't even have to use the word is, as we're going to see, not today, but later on next week. Is will be understood in the translation. So you could say, my wife is good. Okay. Um, usually, the order of the word is you have... The, um, when you have the word good coming after the word is, it is said to be in a predicative position. When it comes after the verb, the adjective, when it comes after a verb, it is said to be in a predicate position. When it is in a predicate position, then you put the adjective first and you put the noun after. So if you want to say, my wife is good, you would say, Tova Ishi. Tova Ishi. Literally, good is my wife. But in standard English form, you would say, my wife is good. What do you do about the she, like she? If you want to say she, yeah, I, I don't remember the form of the word, but there is a pronoun in the Hebrew that you would learn later. That would say she. Yes, yes. Okay, so Tova is good. Ra'a is evil. Gethola is great. And Rama is high. Okay, so notice in Ra. You've just added Thomas A and He at the end of Ra, which is the second word, using 
um, turning it into a feminine form. In the case of Gatol, the third word, which means great, because you add Thomas A and A at the end of Gatol, and you are hurrying in your speech to emphasize the last syllable, the, the Thomas A under the Gimel in the first syllable is changed to a half vowel, a simple shiva. So you have Gethola instead of Gathola, meaning great. In the case of Ram, meaning high, the only change is, is the change of the Mem. This is how Mem looks when it comes at the end of a word. But when Mem is no longer at the end of the word because you add Thomas A plus A at the end of Ram, look what happens. Ram in its feminine form becomes Rama. And the, the way you form the letter Mem changes to this. So Mem at the end of a word looks like this. When it is not at the end, then it looks like this. Um, you may not be able to see it, but this part at the bottom is not connected to this line here. There is a tiny space between. Okay, there is a... I would say there, on the men, there's no stick going up. When it's at the end, there's a stick. Okay, at the end? At the end. That's true, that's true, that's true. There is no stick or projection going up towards the left. Yes, that's true. Okay, now... Next week, we will have to start the next section. I hope that you have understood these basic ideas. What it is basically saying is, whether it's a noun or an adjective, the masculine singular form of nouns and adjectives do not have one ending. They have their own different endings. But when you look at the feminine part of the adjective, when you look at the feminine part of the adjective, it has one ending. The feminine part of the adjective has one ending, and the ending a. is Thomas A followed by A, Thomas A followed by A, Thomas A followed by A, Thomas A followed by A. That's how you know you're dealing with a feminine ending. And the same is true here in the feminine nouns, singular. Thomas A, Thomas A, A, Thomas A, A, Thomas A, A, Thomas A, A. Sign of the feminine singular ending. Okay, so, Lord willing, next week we will officially start this second section of the lesson. We will look at the relationships of adjectives to nouns. Okay. Okay. I've already sent it to you. Did you see? It? Good. So for next week, what I would like you to do is to re is to look over the whole lesson, because what I have found personally is that when I look over my Hebrew lesson before I go to class, I am much better able to understand what the teacher is saying. When I don't look over the lesson at all, I am lost, really lost. Don't have a clue. So you need to prepare because this is not as easy as other courses. This requires more effort to really understand. So you need to prepare for the class. Well, thank you all for joining us in this lesson. I really went over the time, really went over. Thank you all for joining us on the internet and God bless you all. Have a good weekend 
And uh, next week we will continue our Hebrew lesson if God permits. Yes, You're welcome. Shalom. Shalom. Yes.